Welcome to the Startup Grind. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. So uh, we're going to be doing things a little bit different here because we have to share a mic. Are you okay with that? I'm That's not okay. sick, I swear to God. <laughs> so you're okay? Great. So we always like to start out on a personal note. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for coming out. This no, is happy great. You actually, just sort of a tidbit of information, this event almost didn't happen <laughs> because uh, the Congress, they had almost extended the votes, right, mm -hmm. the voting session. And that could have been down to 10 o'clock. So we got It'll lucky. Be a long day tomorrow. It's going to be like a long day tomorrow. So, <laughs> but, um, so we always like to start out the, uh, uh, the fireside chat on a personal note. So if you can talk about uh, where you raised, you know, where you born, mm -hmm. and then probably talk about what your parents did, and then maybe a first entrepreneur experience of a, as a teenager. Mm -hmm. Go there. Okay. Hi, good evening. It's great to be here and good cheer. I, definitely improvement over the first one. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I was born in Selma, Alabama, so a place that many of you know um, for a lot of other reasons um, because of the civil rights movement. In fact, uh, one of the first things I did when I got to Congress was I was able to go on a trip back to Alabama um, with other <coughs> members of Congress, including Congressman John Lewis, and it was a great experience to have a chance to go back because I hadn't been there in quite a while. My family doesn't live, I don't have family there anymore. But um, I was born there. My, um, my parents, my dad was a paper maker, worked at a paper mill there. And not, I was number five, so a lot of kids already. And um, not too long after I was born, probably three years later, my parents ended up um, separating, so we moved. And that kind of started a lot of moving in, in my family. Um, moved all over. My mom was a pilot and wanted to pursue flying a bit more. She became an instructor at Ohio University and taught flying there, <coughs> met her, 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 my stepdad there, and they got married, and he was also a pilot. In fact, she helped teach him to fly, so when we talk about um, women, women uh, in technology, uh, my mom was probably a, a leader, not necessarily in technology, what you think of it today, but definitely in a field that women weren't in as much, especially at that time. But my dad became a, my stepdad, who I really grew up with, was a pilot at what was then Northwest Orient Airlines, if you go back far enough with me. Some of you might, some of you <laughs> don't know what eventually was North, just Northwest Airlines and now is part of Delta. Um, so he was a pilot there, we, and we moved all over. We were in Minneapolis, we were in the Northwest, um, where I went to kindergarten, first grade, we were in Hawaii, um, second and third grade, um, back to uh, Minneapolis, um, and then to Colorado. We lived in Colorado in a few different places in Colorado for a while, and I guess if you ask me where I grew up the most, Colorado might be the place that comes to mind just because I lived there more than I lived any place else. Went to three different high schools, um, and the one that I went for two years was two non-consecutive years. I went there for my sophomore and my, my senior year, and after I graduated from high school, I went to college at a college called Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Um, which is, uh, there's, a, there's a Griffin, a, a Griffin cheer, yeah, go <laughs> Oregon. Um, and that took me out to Northwest and I've been in the Northwest ever since. But, um, you know, my dad, my stepdad, like I said, who I grew up with, was a pilot, lost his job when I was pretty young, I was in the fourth grade. And that really probably started some of the entrepreneurial part of, of uh, our family's life. My dad was a real techie guy at heart, he was a ham radio operator back then and used heat kits. Does anyone know what heat kits are? So heat kits were these kits where you got kind of all the pieces and you built your television or your stereo and we always had something electronic that my dad had built. And he was really an early technology guy except they're probably, he didn't quite realize it then and didn't really have necessarily the same venue to work in. But um, he was very smart, very into technology but it was my mom actually who, when we were struggling, had start had an idea to start up a toy store in a in a very small part of Colorado, a new ski area, which is Vale, which is now not a small ski area, but was very small back then. And she started a toy store um, because she thought there were a lot of kids coming up, and there was no way out in the mountains. There was no place for for kids to have um, access to something to keep them busy. She started a toy store, and mm -hmm. I worked in that toy store growing up a ton. Learned a lot about running a business and I 
ran the business even when my parents weren't able to go. I'd open the store, run the store, close the store at night. So that was really my first experience on what it was like to, to run a company and probably informed me a lot going forward. Sure. Okay, I have to be very selective with my questions because it looks like you're not going to give me the mic for a while. So. <laughs> me, me, Depends me, on me. the question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm like trying to grab it. <laughs> um, so after you graduated from Reed College, uh, you had said that your, um, your dad, your, your parents or your dad had moved in with you. So you really experienced the startup grind, right, as you said. Mm -hmm. Now, can you also talk about, um, you had a, a, another job where you were a high school football referee, is that so? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that must have been a pretty tough job. So talk about how it was like, you know, being in a white male dominated industry and how did, yeah. how did, how did you get into that? <laughs> Um, yes, I was a football referee. I have to mention that the Seahawks were in town because they won the Super Bowl, and they were in town today at the White House. So I got my Seahawks, uh, and it's Blue Wednesday, oh, so I had to wear okay. blue today. So thanks all of you who are wearing blue, because um, I'm sure you're all secretly Seahawks fans, really. Um, but uh, um, I, you know, my mom and, and my biological father were. We're from Wisconsin, big Green Bay Packers fans. Um, football was a big thing in our house. And I knew I was never going to be a football player, but I thought it would be interesting to be a referee. So right out of college, I became a, a high school football referee in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved up to Seattle area, I continued as a referee up in the Puget Sound area. Um, and you know, the key things are sometimes I say it's my best training. I say it's sometimes my best training for Congress um, and was sometimes my best training in the technology industry too. No matter what you decide, someone doesn't like it and you usually get a loud response. And, um, but you have to decide and I think that's so key. You are in a position, you get the best data you can, but it's not perfect data, but you still have to make a decision and you have to you know, tell people what your decision is right away. And it's so important because we're in many places people don't decide and especially in the legislative body, folks don't decide and, and understanding there are consequences to your decision is also important. So that was probably the best training I got okay. um, for a lot of things I did in the future. Okay, great. Um, please tweet out guys, uh, hash, hashtag StarbGrind at Susan Delbeny. At Rep Delbeny. Oh, Rep Delbeny, mm -hmm. okay. Or Susan, Susan. either one. Okay, either way. Um, so. Let's talk about your previous life before drugstore.com because, we'll, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are very interested about that. Um, you were sort of in biotech, you know, right after college, and then you did sort of a switch. You went to Microsoft. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's sort of quite a switch, I think, right? I mean, going from biotech to information systems. So um, why did you decide to take a job at Microsoft instead of sort of taking, you know, steady course on, uh, on biotech? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. So I was a bio major in college. I thought I was going to be a veterinarian um, originally, which is why I went into biology. And I ended up uh, very interested in research and did um, immunology <coughs> research after I graduated from school. And ended up in Seattle working at a biotech company, an early biotech company there called Zymo Genetics, doing, doing research, chimeric antibody research, for those of you who want to look that up. But, um, I was very interested in that and went back to school, to business school, to get my MBA, thinking I was going to go back into biotech. I was interested in the business side of it as well. And Microsoft was recruiting folks for summer internships, and I thought that would be a great uh, thing to try for a summer and learn a lot about software, which is this interesting new thing. Microsoft was still pretty small then. This was 1989. And so I worked there over the summer and ended up staying and working there and ended up uh, working for Microsoft full time after I graduated. So it wasn't necessarily a shift I sure. thought I was going to make, sure. but that's ended up how it happened. Sure, OK. No, no, that's interesting, because then it, uh, it sort of plays in with the drugstore.com. Mm -hmm. Let's talk. Let's get it right into the Microsoft story. Uh, you worked at Microsoft from 1989 to 1998. I think that's what your yes. wiki said. OK, good. Mm -hmm. um, you were director of marketing and business development and product manager roles uh, for Windows 95. Long that time ago. Me. I mean, well, that's 50 Not years that ago. It feels like ago. it's 50 years, but you know. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, and then uh, the first versions of Microsoft Internet Explorer. So, um, so talk about the career in Microsoft. Uh, where, how did it shape you to become an entrepreneur? Because there's a lot of folks here, at startups. They work for very big corporations, big you know government agencies. Um, what sort of the skills you learn from being a big organization like Microsoft, and eventually apply it to a startup, you know, with a drugstore. So, um, you know, when I started at Microsoft in 89, Microsoft was 
relatively small. I mean, mm -hmm. it was still a big, bigger growing company. We were about 5,000 people then compared to <coughs> it is now. But many, many areas were brand new. I worked on electronic messaging, and it was a product called Microsoft Mail for Apple Talk Networks, the first email product that Microsoft had. And you can imagine where it, much before Outlook and Exchange and, and those things. So it was very entrepreneurial, and there, there were many new business spaces and consumer spaces that software was going into. And even you know, every company was trying to find their way and develop. The nice thing about being able to start in a company like that was that you got to focus on products, and you had resources available to meet with customers and talk to customers. Um, so you can focus on products and understanding customer needs. And that really helps you later on um, mm -hmm. when you're doing a, a small business. Um, I worked on embedded systems, which is also an unusual area where you know, kind of software in all sorts of devices, gas station pumps, sewing machines, all those things. So it's also interesting to see the breadth and where technology is being used besides just PCs, which is really the focus at the time. And that opened up a lot of mm -hmm. new ideas for folks. And then obviously on, on Windows 95, that was just a huge international business. And, a, yeah. and they always say, you know, a few versions down the yeah. road, you see those big changes. So it was great to be a part of that and see just how everybody, software had changed from being this kind of niche tech area mm -hmm. to something very mainstream that mm -hmm. people were working with all over the place. No, it's interesting because like, that's sort of like what Google's sort of doing that now, right? They're sort of trying to get their, their hands into everything mm -hmm. as uh, how Microsoft did in the past. So let's go straight into the drug story, uh, drug, st drug <laughs> store story, okay? In <laughs> 1998, you left Microsoft, you found drugstore.com, um, started as a vice president. So we're gonna go into nitty gritty detail here, memory lane, yep. <laughs> I know it's been a while. <laughs> but hopefully, um, you know, entrepreneurs here, it's, it's all about the startup principles and concepts, they pretty much remain, remain the same. So let's talk about um, how did you come up with the idea or the team and then how did you find each other? So how did that team start? Let's, let's go there. So you, at that time you had seen a lot that was, you know, the early Amazon days, um, people were really looking at ways to use technology and change commerce. And when folks are thinking about all the places that people go and to buy things and Amazon clearly had been looking particularly at books at that time. And one of the places that people go on a regular basis was, a, was the drugstore. Um, was also a place, as we talked to folks, that people didn't always want to have to go mm -hmm. um, for a variety of reasons. They didn't want to, they couldn't always find the products they wanted um, because, as you can imagine, if you look at different medical conditions that people might have, there's not always a market where every drugstore down the street can carry products. So there are a lot of products <clears throat> that people needed a, a national market so that you could even stock them and have them available. Um, there are embarrassing products that people didn't want to buy and, and online provided a, a venue there. But there is also pharmacy and helping people um, who especially were had with chronic conditions and had um, drugs they were getting on a regular basis be able to get that a place mm. through the mail. And so there was a customer need there, but it's very complicated in terms of the, especially the pharmacy side, in terms of the regulatory environment, insurance repayments, mm. et cetera. So um, it was definitely more of a bubble time at that time. There, people were getting out very quickly. Um, we had great backing from Kleiner Perkins mm -hmm. and, um, and Mavron in, in Seattle area. Yeah, yeah. And we had a team of folks. My, my boss that I worked with at Microsoft then, a gentleman named Peter Newpert, he and I went together to mm -hmm. help start up Drugstore. Okay. And we had a great team of folks who had background in pharmacy and background in technology and background in retail. And it was that interesting combination of folks too that we needed to bring together. Um, Amazon was also an earlier investor, so they helped us kind of figure out the, how, what was gonna be necessary for a technology platform. But it was very critical to understand the customer need and how online might change mm -hmm. that and create an opportunity where people preferred to buy that way versus buy okay. other ways. And that was the opportunity we were going after. Okay. No, that's interesting because um, that's, I think the story to take away from that, at least when you met your team, she, she had a team already placed at Microsoft. I mean, it was, it was already there, right? And so um, I had done an interview with Aileen Leash of Cowboy Ventures up in, up in the Valley. She had done a um, recent um, survey, a uh, big research actually for mm -hmm. all the unicorns in the Valley. And one of the findings was um, basically all, you know, 
characteristics of what creates a billion dollar corporation startups at, bef uh, after 2003. She said that either they were coworkers, former peers, like former um, employee, or, I'm sorry, coworkers and peers, um, and they, they had technical backgrounds. But it's interesting how you, how you found them in Microsoft. So that's good news for you guys here if you guys are uh, entrepreneurs. So let's talk about like, what's, uh, how did you, what sort of smoke test did you do? Like, you know, how did you realize that this was now um, a business? I mean, because I know you said that back then it was sort of like ideal back on a napkin and then you get funded. But I mean, was it really that easy though? I mean, you sort of had to create a prototype, didn't you? And sort of validate a little bit. Let's talk about that. You know, it was a, a time where things were moving very quickly. Okay. And uh, so I'd say that there were probably, it was more of the concept mm -hmm. was the, was the thing that people were funding. Okay. Um, we didn't have really a temporary website or anything like that when it was built. The concept was there. Yeah. Um, people understood some of the opportunity there, um, but also knew that there were others who might think of that idea. And part of that time, it was really who can get to market first with ideas because people really felt like that was a huge opportunity as well. So I'd say probably, and not necessarily for good reason, yeah. things got invested in very quickly, things moved forward very quickly, and that's, at, at that time in technology, I'm not sure that was necessarily yeah. a positive thing. You didn't, and you look at a company like Google yeah. and how long they were a startup, they got to vet things quite a bit. During that period, there were many things that were out there quickly. And frankly, drugstore went public yeah. um, very, very quickly. And going public was a marketing event in a lot of cases. And um, you know, you normally you go on a road show and you talk mm -hmm. about your quarter over quarter earnings. And we're like, well, we didn't have that quarter before, so we couldn't talk sure. about what happened that quarter. So, you know, like I said, I'm not sure that's always a good nope. thing per se, but there was an impatience at the time that you had to move quickly or you'd miss an opportunity because someone else who moved quickly would capture it. And I do think that uh, the result of that was that sometimes people didn't get the chance to test things as thorough as they could. Now, we, we had you know, financial support to get yeah. through that, but when you're at a time where you may not get that financial support, yeah. you might not have been able to get through that stage. Sure. Now, it it's, sounds very interesting that you had, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, former employees of Microsoft, so we can sort of put it in parallel worlds here. If you were an ex-Googler, right, because that's sort of what the equivalent was back there, you know, does that make sense? Like, you know, hey, there's some startups here. Does it make sense for them to partner up with like an ex-Googler or ex-AOLer or whatever it may be so they can get, get a little bit of credibility under their belt? Because nowadays it's almost it's almost like we're doing a repeat um, of the dot, dot, dot bomb error. <laughs> so let's talk about that. What do you think? I think it's yeah. all about having great people. You okay. don't get a ton of people when you're starting up a company and you need great people. And those great people can have different backgrounds. And the question is, you know, mm -hmm. who are those people and, and who brings them to the table for the role that you need them to help play? And definitely people who've worked in big business have an idea and of how things might operate at scale. And that can be valuable and helpful. And we also have folks who might think, who've worked at big business who, who expect a support structure underneath them. Mm -hmm. So you do a startup and you have to hire somebody. You don't go to human resources and say, can you, you know, get a job description out there for you? There's no one to go talk to. It's you putting that out there. <coughs> and there is, you have to make sure you've got people who can handle that culture and are used to the, the, the fact that they've got to do it themselves. Now, for me, that was one of the huge appeals of doing um, something that entrepreneurial is you knew that success or failure that you were involved and you were part of what made it happen. And a big company, especially if you're one of thousands of people, sometimes you work very hard, but you're never quite sure, is it, would it have had the same result if you were there or, you, or if you weren't there? Um, what impact you get to have? And there's something great about a small business where you really feel direct ownership and, and have that impact yeah. um, and you wanna see yeah. what you can do if you have that opportunity. Right, right. Now, were you sort of involved with the, the product development at that time? So, like, the question would be, you know, we're in our different markets and we're, a lot of us are in this situation where, hey, we're, de we're developing the product. What features should I build out now? Did you guys have sort of a process of what next features to, to build out in the iteration of your product? Absolutely. Okay, so and this is actually it. where, first, I'll bring up an old Microsoft example okay. that I think is very telling. So. 
Um, in, the, in my early career at Microsoft, um, in the early days of Excel, we had a, to get feedback from customers, we had a 1-800 number, um, so that will really take you back. Um, it was 1-800-Excel-WISH, I think. I can't remember how it adds up to the right number of digits, but it was that idea. And people would call in and give their feedback on what features they wanted to see in Excel. And it turned out that, and I don't remember what the exact number is, but around 70% of the feature requests we got in were features that were already in the product, <laughs> but no one knew how to access or use. And I highlight that one, and that one always rings in my mind, because you can think just from a tech standpoint or from an engineering standpoint that, yes, we can do that. But it doesn't really help you out if no one knows how or can figure out how to use it. And it really highlighted how important it is that you interact with your customer and your customer knows it's there. Because we'd have developers who'd be so frustrated, like, well, mm -hmm. of course we can do that. Mm -hmm. But once again, if it's not simple and clear to folks how to use it, and it's so important in software, the user interface and that interaction, and sometimes people forget about that because um, they're just thinking they're checking off features. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing a website, in particular one for commerce, mm -hmm. making sure people can find what they need to find in the easiest way possible, a way that works for them, is so important. Mm -hmm. And that's where just kind of how you categorize things and what's the picture of the product look like so people know it's actually what they thought it was. Do they know what the name of it is? Mm -hmm. or are they more used to the image of it, or what's the combination? And that's really where we spend a lot of time to help people understand and, um, and get the clarity that they needed to make a purchase. Mm -hmm. And you can put all the information up there, but if you don't put it up in the right way, or people don't recognize the product they're looking for, it doesn't matter if it's in your inventory. Yeah. And we spend a lot of time iterating on that and getting mm -hmm. customer feedback. But to do that, you've got to open up a site and kind of have a beta to get that feedback. So you, don't, mm -hmm. you can't necessarily always do it in a closed room. And that's part of the challenge of yeah. e-commerce is opening mm -hmm. up enough to interact with folks. But, um, but to do that, you also need to have enough depth to be able to have a warehouse and ship. And so yeah. You, yeah. you have to do that all together. Now, that sort of highlights the importance of, uh, of having a great designer. Um, I know that. Uh, a lot of the accelerators, 500 startups, tech stars, um, they are, they sort of have like this formula, you know, hacker, hustler, developer. So I'm um, a hacker, hustler, and I'm sorry, uh, designer. Sorry, it's a designer. So you know, they they stress the importance of design, and uh, design is actually the uh, um, sort of the um, um, uh, the secret sauce for a lot of these uh, apps. So let's. I have one more question um, before I go into the other stuff that, uh, for, you know, Congress, because that's what you are. <laughs> that's what you are right now. So we have a lot of uh, important topics to hit there. But um, uh, what was I going to say here? Um, what is sort of the future of, you know, I guess, e commerce and sort of these commoditized, you know, items like drugs and stuff? I mean, do you think that we're sort of in a shift uh, in, 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 in how we deliver goods. So like Amazon obviously is a good example of that. And they're trying to do, they're trying to open up, you know, like drones and, <laughs> and driverless cars. Do you think that it's gonna get to that, to that level of the almost like logistics wise? Uh, what's your opinion about that? You know, let's talk about, let's talk about the future of key commerce about mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about the e-commerce space, and definitely was true of Drugstore and Amazon, is there's a huge physical plant side behind <coughs> it. You know, people talk about the, the website, but in the end, that order has to go through. Someone actually has to find it, pick it, put it in a box, ship it out, and, there's a, and take returns. And so there's a whole process there that is very involved and, like I said, very capital intensive in terms of putting that together. And, so understanding how to optimize that is yeah. so, so important because it can be very expensive if you don't figure out how to optimize it. And I think that's something that you know, probably Amazon has spent a lot of time doing because they got to the scale where they could help do that. And that's mm -hmm. where they do you know, the work now to figure out how they might get you same day delivery in certain areas mm -hmm. because they, you know, as I think Jeff Bezos says something about being able to predict what you might order so that he can mm -hmm. know that he's gonna have it in stock in case you need it. That's so critical, and yet we've seen other areas. Drugstore it was this way for pieces of the business, and definitely in the grocery business, where you have expiration dates on products, and 
Um, and so you end up in a place where mm -hmm. if you don't turn products quickly enough, then you end up with a lot of bad inventory. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you saw that as the early days in, um, in Seattle area, it was home grocer, and you saw a lot of businesses like that where they were trying to do a similar type of e-commerce, but realized that, and that last mile, that last delivery mile was pretty expensive. And unless you had enough critical mass, it was hard to do that. So I still think those are things we're working through. That last mile is still critical and can be expensive. Uh, and trying to do it same day, especially mm -hmm. if it's not an expensive purchase where there's more margin. Yeah. How do you scale to make that worthwhile? Um, that's gonna be a, a key challenge. And you've seen interesting combinations of brick and mortar plus online, and there are opportunities there. Mm -hmm. So is it always pure e-commerce or is it some combination? I know people like the idea of going to a store and actually seeing a product or trying it on. And there are things that have, you, know, you need more customer service on and some you can get that customer service online, some not quite so much. So I think you're gonna see some interesting combinations there too. But to really help drive the cost structure, mm -hmm. the, the back end's gonna matter a lot okay. because, uh, because like I said, if you can't spread that cost over a lot of different products, it can be pretty expensive to put it together. Okay, great. That's interesting you say that because we had uh, interviewed uh, Dave Gilboa of um, Warby Parker. He had mentioned about vertically integrated brands and basically pretty much owning the whole supply chain. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have, they have this offline online, they have an off, they have an actual building. They, they're so, they sell their Warby Parker um, glasses at the store and then they have like an Apple-like experience online. So it's kind of mm -hmm. interesting. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, you, you were in 2000, you went on to be CEO of Nimble Technology where then you had been acquired by Actuate. Mm -hmm. So I guess, um, and then from there, uh, then you went back to Microsoft, right? Mm -hmm. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, why didn't you stay in the startup world and, and you went back to you know, Microsoft or the Google or whatever it may be? So what, what was mm -hmm. sort of your thought process there? Well, we talked about it earlier. There are a lot of interesting things, entrepreneurial things that can happen in big businesses mm -hmm. too. And sometimes you need some of that scale. Yeah. And when I went back to Microsoft, I went back to work in the mobile business, so the early days of, of, um, of connected devices and what now you think of as smartphones. <coughs> and one of the interesting things there is it, you need some scale. You have mobile operators around the world. You're working with OEMs. You are trying to create a platform, and that platform has to have some scale to move forward. And so in some yeah. of those areas, especially in those early days, to help create that platform, yeah. scale mm -hmm. and investment mattered. And so it was an interesting opportunity to be able to do that. And the relationships were with, like I said, mobile operators in that case. And they were generally big companies around the world who, if you didn't have that connection, your device wasn't super helpful. You know, now you've got more Wi-Fi out there. There's more um, ability to move devices around. But then things were very, even more mm -hmm. so locked in. And so it's an interesting opportunity to see how you could try to be entrepreneurial mm -hmm. in with, with some of the resources of a big company and help make that happen. Now there are challenges to that too, yeah. um, but that's, that was one of the interesting opportunities yeah. in going back to Microsoft then. So was, you thought that you had more impact going to Microsoft and you know, mobile being very big? In that space. Okay, in that space, right. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about that. Like, do you think there are different skill sets being an executive operator for a big corporation versus a founder of a startup? What are those differences? And, are they similar? I don't know. Um, I think there's definitely similarities and there are differences. Similarities in the sense that, as I said earlier, you have to decide. I mean, if you're leading any organization, whether it's a small organization or your uh, organization of one or a large organization, you have to decide what your path is going forward. <coughs> one of the things people do is avoid deciding in a lot of cases and end up not having a vision for their business. And it's important to decide and frankly to learn from your decisions. Sometimes you don't make the right decision, but actually some of your best learning might be understanding what you did wrong and adjusting based on that. And so that's important in any scale or size of a company. Clearly in a very large organization where you have a lot of people, you're spending a lot of time on, on making sure the organization is moving in the same direction. 
Um, it's, if you're in a small organization, you can walk down the hall or people can sit in a conference room and talk. And there's something great about that and being able to move very, very quickly. And it clearly is harder when you're a large organization to get everybody on the same page. Yeah. And that's probably the biggest difference and one of the biggest challenges. Mm. Okay. Please tweet out, start, hashtag Startup Grind, at Rep Delbany. Um, let's talk about women in technology. This is a very interesting topic. I'm sure you're very a big proponent of this. But uh, Vivek Wadwa, uh, he's a very well-known entrepreneur in the Valley. Uh, he had done a, a survey of 1,000 women in the Valley, and uh, he pointed out a lot the gender and uh, racial disparities in, in Silicon Valley. And then he had found out like 50% of bachelor and master degrees, um, and nearly, and the same thing with doctorate level degrees, uh, were, were, of, you know, were given to women. And yet 3% of technology companies are run by women. So I, I guess the question would be like, why is there a gender gap this big, I mean, it's, it's so big, it's, it's not even funny. And what needs to happen to, to close this gap? So if you can look at the camera, you can say Silicon Valley, you know, what to do, so. Well, you know, there's other great startup areas besides Silicon Valley, okay. too. You know, from uh, us sure. Seattle folks want to okay. remind everybody about that. Um, and maybe Amy Millman from Springboard out there um, can talk about this, too, because she's been working on it for a long, long time. But um, the part of it is making sure that as you know, young people across our country are excited about opportunities and get engaged and involved in learning and love to learn. And um, making sure that we have young women who are engaged and involved in technology and feel like there are opportunities that are available for them. You know, I was probably more naturally a math and science person. That's where I felt comfortable. So I didn't need the folks to tell me that it's okay to, to you know, that math is an exciting thing and convince me. I just kind of it naturally made sense to me and was something that I wanted to work on. But clearly, you, you, if you watch how everyone learns in a different way, we have such an opportunity to make sure kids feel like they have those opportunities. And just because they don't understand something you know, in, in elementary school right away, that they might find a different way to learn than other kids might learn that subject. And they may, it may be something that they're really excited about doing. So, to solve these issues, I think we got to start from early learning all the way through in terms of how we describe opportunities to folks. I think the other thing, and you hear this a lot, is that there weren't many women role models. You didn't see many opportunities out there. Um, you know, I was a when when we start up um, Nimble Technology, I was a Springboard alum. So Springboard was an organization that was helping connect women CEOs with capital that was available because women didn't have as many connections with the venture community. And so even though they had great ideas, they didn't even know who to talk to and didn't have the connections to get funding as much. And so they set up forums just to put women entrepreneurs in front of the venture capital community so they could see some of the great ideas that are out there and help facilitate those connections so that mm. there was more activity there. And, um, and I do think that being open, this is probably true across the board, being open to different work styles, to different you know, ideas and ways of thinking. You, we talked about kind of how important it is to think things through, not just from a pure architectural standpoint, but from the customer experience. And for a long time early on, you know, it was the developers ruled, and then everyone who was doing the business side around it were just kind of you know, overhead to help the business go forward. And I think now what we see more and more is how important it is that to have a business be really successful, we need to have great technology and great interactions with customers. And if you have great interactions with customers, you've got to have people who kind of represent all those customers. So we've seen opportunities and openings there. Last thing is, when you're starting a company, what do you want the culture of your company to be like? I mean, it's your company, you're starting it. Would you want to work there? Um, do other people want to work there? Because we all make decisions about where we work kind of based on kind of what the company's doing and your interest level there, but there's also other things. Do you like the people you're working with? Do you like kind of the vibe you get when you go in and talk to folks? And I think that's very important because especially in a small company, you're going to be working closely together and people need to make, realize there's an opportunity for them and they're mm -hmm. going to be you know, be able to be part of that mix. And that's important for diversity across the board in, in new companies. Uh, what's your opinion about uh, integrating like, or getting women more involved in engineer school? So when I, when I went to engineer school, um, 
you know, my CS class of, of 100 uh, hackers, <laughs> there were only two women. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I just recently saw that um, an article, Carnegie Mellon had now accepted 46% women. So do, don't you think that that's, mm -hmm. so like, can you create legislation? I don't know, like, oh, what can, what, how can we encourage um, like universities to, to, to do something like that? You know, accept more women in their engineer programs. Well, I, you know, I think, once again, if you start early, you can really make a difference. There have been interesting things. Um, how many of you know about code.org and some of the work they're doing? I got to spend some time in my district with um, kids who are working on, you know, writing code, except they didn't really know they were writing code, right? They were mm -hmm. kind of working on puzzles and working through those puzzles. And it was interesting that when they were able to do that and approach something, a technology issue that way, and they saw they're making progress and you solve this puzzle and then they show you actually the code that was created when you solved the puzzle. You could see um, kids who didn't think they were technology kids and, and young women who didn't think they were technology people be like, hey, I did that. Yeah. And those, just that part I think is such a, has such an impact on people's confidence and belief that they actually could be really good at something um, like, so, like software mm -hmm. development. It doesn't just have to be software development go to a shop in a school. We have a lot of advanced manufacturing in my district. Um, have people get experience and shop, et cetera. Um, it, 3D printing has been interesting and to see how kids are interacting there, both, both young women and men, and um, has changed some of those barriers and some of those stereotypes. So I do think that you're gonna see a change over time because schools, it's not just about schools, uh, alone accepting people. It's about people being excited and wanting to go into those areas. I think that's the biggest change. And I think you are seeing some of that happen now, but, um, but it's gonna, uh, to go through, to get kind of all the way through from beginning through the cycle, it's gonna take a while to make sure we continue to build those numbers. And I think we're on a good path, but we've gotta to continue to support that. Okay. And then one last question, women in technology, um, before we go into you know, your legislative activity. But uh, what are some of the ways that we can as startups here, um, sort of uh, get more women involved in the management roles of startups? Like what is sort of the benefits for doing that? Well, um, as I, I think you know, we were talking about before, one, if, you, if you're looking at kind of where your business is going and who your customers are gonna be, um, making sure you have people who represent and can, you know, your customer base and are able to understand their needs. So if you're going for a broad customer base, then it's important to, to have that highlighted within your business, I think. And, but I also think that if you want to continue to attract a diverse workforce, it's going to be important that people realize there are opportunities there for them. And that is being able to see that you have, uh, that you have women in leadership positions or, or, um, folks with different backgrounds who come come in different ways. You know, I started my career in biotech, and in biotech, if you didn't have a PhD, you weren't allowed to be a scientist because everything was very academically driven. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about technology is that you know in the early days of tech, you didn't have to have a degree mm -hmm. at all. You just ended up proving yourself on the job, and that's and people kind of went through that. And so if you're gonna if you're gonna bring people together with different backgrounds, you've got to make sure that you're open to that. And um, th that was an interesting change to see on a, a industry area that had you know, been around for a long, long time and had, you know, was very credential based. You had to get your credential before you were allowed to go in the next space. And technology companies started quickly and didn't really look at that as much. And therein lies a huge opportunity. And, um, and so I think it's gonna be important that we, we, you always keep your eyes open and look for great people who can bring great things to your business and identify them. And mm -hmm. sometimes they may not have the traditional backgrounds that you think, no. and it's really gonna be about you keeping your eyes open and seeing that. Okay. Um, just so you guys know, um, this event is, is uh, sponsored by uh, Google 40 Forward, which is they're dedicating um, about 100 chapters all over the world uh, to interview women entrepreneurs. So um, you know, that's great kudos for, for Google. Mm -hmm. And then and all the guys here in this room who are sort of nodding off because it's women yeah. technology, 50% of this room is women, so you better, better watch out. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about um, uh, sort of your con in Congress. So um, I love your story of redemption. Uh, you actually, you ran for Congress 2010, but you lost. And then 2012, you ran again and you won. 
and which I, I mean, this is, it's, 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 it's a really amazing story, redemption. Um, do you think running for Congress is sort of like running a startup? <laughs> well, you can talk about the story, but you know, yep. I want to know the answer to that one. Yep. Um, Sure. I mean, sure. a campaign is an entrepreneurial activity or starting, you're starting something from scratch. It is hard because you're the product. And that's probably, I think, the hardest thing about campaigns and elections. It's different when you're selling and talking to people about a product or something you've built. It's another thing when you're talking to people and it's much more personal because mm. it's about you. And I'd say that's probably the biggest difference between working in business and um, and talking to customers versus running, <coughs> running for office and talking to constituents and to voters. But you have to build that up. You have to build a team of folks. Um, if your team's gonna work well together, it's gotta be a team that you know, respects each other and is working well together and understands what progress you're making and you're not making. Mm -hmm. So that's very, very important. Um, and actually, when you get to Congress, it's very entrepreneurial because they just tell you, here's the amount of money you get kind of to spend as a member of Congress. Do what you will. You can hire more people, less people, depending on what you want to do. You can um, spend money on other things, on you know, technology in your office mm -hmm. for you know more offices in your district, less, and people make different decisions best based on the region they serve in. You've got a member of Congress, one person who serves the whole state of Montana, Montana, and then you have someone who might have a few square blocks in Manhattan, mm -hmm. and the needs are very, very different in terms of what they put together. But having that experience of knowing how to put something together from scratch is incredibly helpful, yeah. um, for whether it's for a campaign or yeah. whether it's for, yeah. um, actually coming as a member of Congress. Mm -hmm. But it, it, you know, I had the opportunity after after my first run in 2010, the governor of the state of Washington appointed me to run the Department of Revenue for the state. And that was a great experience to be an administrator of policy, to work with a team. I brought my team, you know, my, my experience running a team from things I had done as an entrepreneur, but also at Microsoft. And so walking in and running a team was not foreign to me. Um, and so, but they were used to political appointees who hadn't done that before, so I was a little bit different there. But seeing the handcuffs that are put on you when you're running an organization, but you have to follow based on particular statutes and laws that were written, and how that can be restrictive from trying to get to the end goal you want to have was so important and something that informs me a lot now as a member of Congress. I think it'd be great if all members of Congress had to actually administer policy for a while and see that policy that looks great in theory um, is not necessarily the most streamlined or efficient way to actually deliver the result you want. And how we look at that and work through that is going to be important if we're going to be good, you know, quick moving in mm -hmm. policy and allow, um, and allow government to move more quickly too. Okay. Now let's, let's, let's talk about that. So uh, what sort of, I mean, you're, you, you, came, you came from the Department, Department of Revenue, which is sort of the IRS for the state, right? Um, are you working on any policies that are tax policies that are helpful for startups? Let's talk about let's, what are sort of the in, uh, legislative in, initiatives that you're working on that will help the startup community? Well, one particular tax policy that many of you may, uh, may know about too is called the Marketplace Fairness Act, which is the internet sales tax. Mm -hmm. In Washington state, we are a sales tax state. We don't have an income tax. So that mm -hmm. makes it a little bit different okay. um, because we, we only have gross receipts taxes based on, on sales. And right now we have a huge challenge where, um, and we have Amazon in our state, right? So they're charging sales tax for, for sales within our state. But we have the local running store where people go in and try <coughs> on shoes and get fitted and then decide to buy online because if they buy online from someone out of state, they don't, those folks don't collect sales tax. And in a state like ours, that could be you know nine and a half percent that they're not paying because they don't pay sales tax. Yet, all of the the service was provided by that local retailer. They're paying rent. They hired people, etc. And they're in the state working in the community. And yet, that sale there's an incentive to, um, for some folks to to buy from someone out of state because of that price difference. The Marketplace Fairness Act is a piece of legislation that's been worked on for a long time to say. That things should that if you are an out of state retailer, online retailer selling in a state, even if you don't have physical presence there, you're still going to collect that local sales tax. To say that 
there shouldn't be a difference between whether you're a brick and mortar store actually in a state versus an online retailer. You're both gonna collect sales tax. Um, now, if you're a state that doesn't have any sales tax at all, they kind of, you know, this differentia differentiation is kind of nice because then you can have businesses locate there. Mm -hmm. They don't have to charge sales tax there and they can, you know, sell stuff across the country and it does create an unequal playing field and it's hurt a lot of online businesses as well as small businesses and you've seen a lot of um, brick and click businesses concerned about this. This piece of legislation I was working on even when I was at the Department of Revenue because in a state like Washington we lose state and local revenue because people decide to buy online from out of state to, to mm -hmm. not um, pay that money and it's a tax that's actually already due. Mm -hmm. So that's a piece of legislation we've been moving on a lot. It's um, been it's actually something we're taking up in the Judiciary Committee, which is a committee I sit on. So that's one that's important, and it's important for small and big businesses, depending on what you're working on. But clearly things like tax credits for R&D, um, making sure that small business, we can do everything possible to deal with the administrative overload of running a small business is so important. If you're a small business and you're spending all your time and your resources on filling out forms and, and reporting back and trying to keep up to date, it's really hard for you to invest in your core business. And that's something that at the state level, local level, and the federal level, we always need to be conscious of to help small businesses of all kinds to thrive. Okay. One last question before we open up to Q&A. What can we do as a startup community to help support you as a congresswoman? I'd say be engaged, um, you know, be engaged in policy, understand that policy can impact what's happening, especially in, in, depending on the business area you're in, you may be surprised to find out that there are policies that um, impact what you're doing. You know, when we were starting up drugstore, we thought we're a retail, we're a retail store. You know, people come online, we're just like a, a drugstore down the street, except in um, pharmacy environment, when people sent prescription drugs to the mail is considered mail service pharmacy and that's a different type of pharmacy and is a different environment than a traditional retail pharmacy and we were stuck in between we thought we were retail but because we shipped um, prescriptions through the mail we were from a kind of more of a regulatory standpoint thought of as a mail service pharmacy and that's something we learned while we were going impacted whether we could get reimbursed for insurance was definitely a hard thing all of the businesses that you engage with involvement may have impacts that pol or policy may have an impact, not something necessarily just broad like tax policy, but something maybe specific to the vertical you're working in. And it's incredibly important to understand that and to be engaged <coughs> and involved because you can help drive policy if you're engaged and involved and, um, and have a voice so that policy actually helps your business, helps the entrepreneurial um, environment out there as opposed to stymies it. And the only way we get there is if um, folks work together and, and are engaged and involved. Okay, great. Uh, we're going to open up the floor to Q&A. So anybody who is, first of all, uh, City Pass, raise your hand, or VIP. Uh, you have a question? But I'll defer to the floor and I'll ask my question later. Okay, sure. <laughs> so, all right, so let's, first question. Uh, my name's Coleman White. Stand up. I'm going to be a constituent in about six weeks of moving to Kirkland. Good, good for you. So I'm looking forward to the coffee, the uh, Viking, the uh, Seahawks, <laughs> the lack of income tax. <laughs> but uh, what's going on out there in the First District, and uh, is it a, still a good business environment, and uh, especially for startups, which is what I'm going to be doing to really work with startups? Mm -hmm. You know, um, the first district is actually a great district because it's so diverse economically. We have tons of technology. We have Microsoft. We have a you know, Google has a big facility out there. Nintendo's U.S. headquarters are there. Tons of gaming companies and enterprise software and a little bit of everything. But we also have a lot of biotech, a lot of biomedical devices. We have a lot of aerospace because of Boeing. We have a lot of ag and a lot of agricultural technology and research going on. And then up in the north, we have two oil refineries and aluminum smelter. I mean, we have a little bit of everything. And I think one of the interesting things is you look at new opportunities in the future, whether it's you know, tech plus bio, you know, traditional information technology plus biotech and some interesting things that are happening there, things that are happening with advanced manufacturing. Um, there are huge opportunities. And that's what I love is that there's all of that interaction. Some places and places that tech people don't think of as tech 
I always remind tech folks there's a lot of great tech happening in agriculture, but when you talk to software folks, they forget about that. And so that's one of the things I think in our region is so um, interesting and provides a lot of great innovative opportunities is being able to think even more broadly on um, how technology can have an impact in a, in a broad set of ways. We have a lot of the, a lot of people in Washington State who are entrepreneurs who kind of came that way. That's really driven a big part of our economy. And we're also um, very global. We're the most trade dependent state in the country. And so if you look at a lot of these markets as being global markets, that's another great reason to be out our way. We have the University of Washington nearby. They're doing great work in a lot of areas. So, so of course, I'd say yes. And, uh, and we, our football team is uh, doing pretty well, too. You didn't really answer this question about coffee, but <laughs> uh, this is our sponsor, so he has to. Oh, no. Yeah, he gets he gets priority. Here you go, James. No priority, but um, my question has to do uh, with women and, and breaking down barriers. Um, when I was growing up, I, we had the, had the good fortune of several family friends who had been women pilots mm -hmm. in World War II and took part of the Wasp Corps, and throughout the rest of their lives were some of the most uh, strong. Uh, there were they knew no barriers, and everything they did through the rest of their lives, and I'm. You seem to have lived your life that way so far, and I, I'm, this is sort of answering the question for you, but I'm assuming, you know, what your mom did. Back in World War II, I'm sure when your mom was coming up, and even now, aviation is an industry that is not at all dominated by women. And I'm sure, having grown up with a mom who was a pilot, can you speak to the influence that had on the way you've lived your life? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I think that's true. You know, my mom was definitely someone who, and still is someone who thinks that she could do anything. She never felt inhibited about what her opportunities were um, and got involved in a field that women weren't really involved in, but also helped start a business. She started a toy store, which you know helped take care of our family for a few years. She ended up, um, you know, my parents, went, so things got harder after that. My, when, and um, as Brian was saying earlier, when I graduated from college, my parents moved in with me and um, not long after that, my mom joined the Peace Corps and went to Africa and actually worked there for quite a long time for the Peace Corps and then later on um, doing business development in northern Botswana um, in the Kalahari Desert with the Kalahari Bushmen, for those of you who took um, some anthropology a long time ago. And she was always willing to try something different and new and, um, and engage in that. And I think for myself and my sisters, we never knew otherwise that there was a barrier in front of us. And, you know, when we talk about having those opportunities, she obviously played a big role there, and um, and hopefully we can do the same um, with our kids. I have a daughter and a son, but I you know I hope that they both feel like they have the ability to do whatever they want to do if they're willing to work hard at it and and put in the effort. Paul, I see you, but we got to get a woman to ask a question. So oh, there we go, Amy. <laughs> That's perfect. So I'm interested in how the race is going. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm in a swing district. It's a, it's a, was set up to be a swing district. We were talking about the diversity of my district, and so um, it is a, it's a diverse district, and a, a great district. I actually think you're a better legislator when you hear every point of view possible coming at you, and you have to figure out how to work through that and put together solutions that address all those issues. So, I, we just had our filing deadline last week in Washington State. Um, we're a top two primary, like um, you see in California, so we don't have partisan primaries. Everybody's in the primary together. Um, six folks filed to run against me, so we've got, we're gonna have a big, a big group of folks kind of all over um, who are in our primary. Our primary's in August, so um, that's what we're working on now, but our filing deadline was last Friday, so that's kind of the most recent news right now. I'm looking forward to voting. Let's get another woman. <laughs> any, any another woman? Register to vote. Any questions? Okay, here we go. Another one? Okay. All right, okay, two. Um, you know, it's interesting, Greg's work.com launched at a time when permissionless wasn't the go-to. And regulations um, make it difficult for, or being able to figure out what your regulatory structure is, makes it difficult for some startups. I mean, think about your time pharmacy and think about the early banking and things. Is there a way that we can make the regulatory structure easier for people interested in starting businesses, either you know, as entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs, to find that information? 
you know, um, one of the interesting things we saw is that, you know, if you have businesses who are very entrenched in a particular business model, it's hard sometimes to get things changed because things are that way and you got folks fighting against you as you try to change policy and even change the regulatory environment in a way that might be more open to other ideas. And that's why being engaged is so important because as we go through, and you see it in judiciary, we're looking at things like patent reform or copyright reform, which you know, really, um, it, when you hear people come into hearings, talk about impacts on their business model. You've got old business models who want to see things go in a certain direction that might favor their business models. You have new business models who feel like they have better opportunities if, if we look at things differently. And that's why I'd say it's not, there, is there any one policy? Not necessarily. It's understanding how policy impacts the particular business that you're, you're working in or looking at creating. And, um, and also realizing that, unfortunately, policy moves at a much slower pace. And clearly, when you try to change policy, there are folks who think that they, if they think they might lose based on that policy change, are going to fight hard against it. And people who think they win fight hard for it. And um, that creates part of the challenging dynamic in terms of moving policy forward, particularly when we're in a, a divided Congress like we are now, um, and things aren't moving quickly anyway. So. Um, I'd say be aware, understand how you operate in the environment that exists today and understand what might need to change to help you out and start working on that right away and being engaged and, and help inform people because remember you've got a lot of folks, a lot of members of Congress or in the state legislature, et cetera, depending on what you're working on, who may not understand what your business is trying to do and why, why a certain policy might have an impact in a certain way. Um, we just had a bunch of um, folks in Seattle area, it was Uber and Lyft and others you know, coming in and that's been a big conversation at the Seattle City Council and these are places where, once again, people need to be educated and understand how policy impacts them so that they can make decisions going forward and it's going to be really up to you to help drive part of that, especially if you have a new innovative idea that people don't really understand or, or haven't heard of before. Okay, we have time for one more question. So anybody have a question and then she'll pick. Oh, he deferred earlier. Okay, deferred, okay, so there you go. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for what you do with women entrepreneurs. I mentor a number of women entrepreneurs and companies in the area. My question is, if I was a Wizard of Oz and I could grant you a wish to solve one social or human problem that's important to you, what would it be and why? Well, gosh, there's a lot of them. Um, but um, if you're going to ask for kind of immediate impact from a policy perspective. Um, I don't care about policy. Not that I don't care about what's in your heart. Um, you know, for me, one of the, I feel like I'm where I'm at today because <coughs> I had opportunity. I was given a chance. I was able to get a great education even when my family was struggling and were moving around. I got to go to college because of things like student loans and financial aid and work study. And I don't, think, I don't know if I'd be in the same position today if I were growing up in that same situation because um, we're, we're making it harder for people to have that same chance. So if I could do one thing, it would be to, for everyone to realize that a lot of us are here today because you know, previous generations invested in us to be here and make sure that we understand we need to, to have a place where everyone has that same access to opportunity um, and we make sure that we continue to invest in that going forward. Okay, so two more questions, and we always end it with these questions. Um, if you could give your advice, if you give advice to yourself 15 years ago, what would it be? 15 years ago? Or 20 years? What? Okay. What, 15, okay. sorry, 15. Um, gosh, there's so, it's, hindsight's 2020, as my <laughs> mom always says, so it's uh, great to look back. But um, I think, I have a sign in my office that one of my employees at Microsoft gave me a, a long time ago that says, love what you do. And I think you're, you, this is your life. This is a good chunk of time you're spending in your life. You do a great job when you love what you do. And it's so important to do that. And some of you have probably made decisions over time where you're doing something you don't love as much or, or um, don't have the opportunity. It's such a luxury to have the opportunity to do something that you love. And so remind yourself of that all the time um, and, and how, and, and don't give up on that. Um, keep working hard on that because 
you can do amazing things, but um, but you can do, you do even more amazing things when you really enjoy what. That doesn't mean you think every day is you wake up and and is perfect, right? There are hard challenges and it can be painful, but um, but getting that great result is so important. And I know there are times where um, I. I kind of get involved in a job and work and, and I'm doing it because, and you get kind of in that rote world and go back to remember you love what you do and that's partly the reason my career path has gone in, in directions that I didn't even expect because I saw opportunities available that, that were exciting to me and I took them as opposed to have a planned path and I'd say um, take advantage of that too. One more, one last question. Most important question. So who's your first favorite Superhero or historic, historic figure in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so to be fair, I got this question ahead of time. So I was able <laughs> with, um, but uh, <coughs> historic figure for me was Marie Curie for many of the reasons we talked about. Early scientist, Nobel Prize winner, a woman who was successful in a time where people didn't think women should be successful or even have those same opportunities. Um, we we. We need to remind folks um, and, and that there are opportunities available, as we talked about before. And so she was a, definitely an early leader way before her time. So obviously you already told me this answer. And what we usually do is uh, either go on eBay, try to find something. Uh, and you gave me the answer like pretty late. So <laughs> I, but I, but I, I managed to find something at Barnes & Noble's. In the kids section. Something, is it radioactive? <laughs> and it's uh, Mary. Curry, uh, uh, National Geographic Kids, and in fact, what this book is um, actually, if you don't mind, I actually read it to my daughter, and uh, I couldn't put put down the book, and uh, and she's like, now she's my favorite, she's my favorite historic figure. So, oh, good. Right, yeah. so there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> See you, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much.